<laughs> well, uh, you know, those are a lot of things, Tony. But first, it's point blank. You know, William Ruto is the deputy to the president. And the, in the Kenyan law right now, there is no mechanism for firing a deputy president. So I think it stands to logic that they are tied in the hip and the president, therefore, must work with his deputy. I don't think you can fault him for that because un unlike the previous constitution where the president was entitled to appoint a deputy that they want, in the current constitution, the deputy is a running mate. And as a running mate, the only way the deputy president can be removed is by impeachment through parliament, not by the president. I must interrupt you. Yes. The deputy president went on TV yes. and said Kerala is clear, the dams are clear. He said everybody talking about it was nonsense. Yes. The president has talked about it today. Is yes. the president talking nonsense? Utiende, are you here to defend? No, no, no. But Listen, I put it to point what I'm explaining to you, one, is the law. And the law is that the president has no powers to remove his deputy. However, two, the question then you should be asking, and it's a question, is a legitimate question, that if we have a situation where the deputy president appears not to be deputizing the president, and there are so many examples, isn't it logical that either that person should resign or should be removed? That is a logical question. I have suggested in other, uh, in elsewhere that if you are deputy president and you come to a time when you do not feel you are on all fours with the president, then it is right for you to resign. But if you don't, then the body that can take any such initiative should be parliament. Senior counsel, Secondary. Senior counsel yes. the deputy president has held a press conference, has been at a public function, and said the dams are clean. And anybody talking about it is nonsense. The head of state to do Hurumuigai Kenyatta has cancelled the dam project. I'm yes. asking you as a senior counsel, as a politician, what does that mean to Kenya? Well, but what it means, it's obvious that, one, the deputy president is not reading from the same crypt as the president, which is wrong, and I've said that. Two, it means that there's a sense of dysfunctionality in that presidency. But thirdly, it is true that there isn't a sense, and there are a lot of Kenyans who are starting to ask the question, that why is it that the president says A, the deputy president says B, but the president does not seem to be emphatic enough on the things he's saying. I think, and as we are talking about Kimarer and Arod, for example, this is the time to now ask hard questions. And I think this is the time for the president, now that he even received that report, to ask hard, direct questions to his deputy and to all those others who are involved in the project. Because you cannot have a situation where the deputy president says there's nothing wrong, and the team comes with a very clear report showing everything wrong and it is canceled. Well, might, uh, These answers must come from the president, not from me, Tony. Mwishimua, we can only observe. No, Mwishimua, you know Raila Odinga is my friend. Yes. And I'm going to ask him tomorrow. And yes. I'm going to look for him point blank. Yes. Is the time coming when he has to ask Kenyatta not to st stop playing games? Because you, he's going to Kibra to campaign with Odinga, with, against Odinga, with Ruto. I mean, he is the man accused of standing up to defend the dams. Kenyatta has now instructed the dams be stopped. What message is he giving the people of Kibra? Tony, you're jumping. <laughs> I mean, Tony, you're jumping. I'm going to ask Odinga. The president to... has not come to Kibra yet. <laughs> that is speculative. Whether he will come or not uh, we, is, is an open question. And I told you how I think we will react. But the legitimate question, and you are completely right on this, is that the president for the last year, has spoken passionately against corruption, has spoken passionately against certain things that should be done. But for every other thing he says, the deputy president seems to age away from it. And the legitimate question you are insinuating and a lot of people have been asking is that why is the president not speaking directly to his deputy face on on these matters? Because it does appear that there are many instances in which the deputy is involved in a number of things and which Ike the president, but he does not seem to face him head on. He ought to face him head on. Whether he has the power to remove him or not is a different matter. But the question of accountability, for example, now, having received the report, he should ask his deputy to apologize to Kenyans for having said that that project was viable, no money was lost, and yet clearly some money was lost. So to that extent, I agree with you. But that is a question for the president and his deputy. 
That is not a question for me or Raila Odinga. Well, I'll leave you with this question in your conscience. And the question is this. Is not your ODM wasting your political capital? This handshake, everybody wished you well. Everything seems romantic. The time is coming when you can't hide behind Kibra. And I am saying to you, is there going to be a time when Odinga rings Kenyatta and says, I can't do this anymore? I must walk the talk. Is ODM going to call its party leader and hold him to account? Because you are now going to an election in Kibra. How can the people of Kibra know what to do? If you, Omolo, or Tiende don't know, Atiende Omolo don't know what to do. How can they make a proper choice in the elections in November? So I'm putting it to you point blank. Is it time also for ODM to wake up from the slumber? It's not enough for, for Kiereweke to fight your battles. What about ODM? Let me explain two things. First of all, about Kibra. It is interesting, and as the campaigns uh, thicken, you will be seeing members of Jubilee campaigning with us. I know so many of, uh, of my colleagues who are elected on Jubilee and who have voted they will not campaign for the Jubilee candidate. They will campaign for us, uh, you know. So you, the, when the plot thickens, you will really see it, it is thick. Can, can That's one. I'm a that, Odinga. Let's move to that is one. No, no, of, no, yes, no, no, let yes. me explain. Yes. Yes. The second one, at, is there a time when Raila will then have to call Uhuru, and that was your question. In my view, the handshake was good and important, and it served a lot of purposes in this country. It then generated the BBI. The time to call to question everything is once the BBI report is out, it has been shared, it has been discussed, and then the question is, what next? If at that point, the president and his team were to take a radically different view of the way forward from that which Raila Odinga and the ODM party were to take, then that will be the time when it will come to a head. It has not come to a head. Kibra cannot be an issue to bring the handshake. Sasa Kenyatta Meskia Odinga Meskia Ipoyblan. Tupunguze mzigo wa maapana mwishima. Where have we reached? As I saw Siaya, Homa B have rejected, Moranga, uh, what, what and is, yes, I, I think it was... Uh, Mizigo. Uh, yes. Siaya, which is my county of extraction, was the first to reject. Um, and then I think it was Nyeri. Was it Nyeri? Uh, Kirinyaga and then Muranga. I have said on this show before that Punguza Mzigo is ill-conceived and ought to be rejected on merit. And I saw subsequently, my friend Dr. Kure Kot came here and, uh, you know, has always been calling a lot of us names and all that. It's not about name calling. It is about merit. And I've explained, and wherever I go, I explain why we should reject Punguza Muzigo, not because it's initiated by Dr. Kure Kot, but because on its face, it is in, in fact, if that thing was to pass, this document we call the Constitution will be the most chaotic thing you ever saw. Because it is not even in consonance with the provisions of for, the Constitution. For example, Monsieur. Now, for example, one, I saw uh, a Kuro Court say in your show, and he's been telling people, that Punguza Mzigo is going to solve the question of representation 50 50 for women. Punguza Mzigo makes provision for one woman and one man for election in the National Assembly. In the Senate, it removes the provisions for nominated senators, it does not make an alternative provision. How will you achieve the 50-50 in the Senate? How will it achieve representation when right now elected senators who are women, I think, are barely three? There are very few. It does not. Two, it says that it's making the Senate the upper house and the National Assembly the lower house. And it purports to do that by saying the Senate shall be the upper house. You don't make a house an upper house by declaring it so. You make a house an upper house by giving it the powers that are superior to the other one. Right now, under the Constitution, the National Assembly makes law. Senate participates in lawmaking. It makes the National Assembly the upper house factually. If you want to change that, then you take the powers in the National Assembly and give them to the Senate. So those are just two examples. I can give you 20 reasons why it is illegitimate and it makes claims that are unfounded in law and fact. So it has to be rejected. And I therefore, um, I allowed the, now, the, the counties that have so far rejected it. I was also asking, in terms of him failing in counties, how many has he covered? What is the percentage of his success or failure? Because people say what he has failed. Has he succeeded? What has left? To the best of my knowledge, there is no county that has adopted it. 
I think there have been fora where uh, Dr. Kuru has spoken to MCAs in what you would call a kamukunji, and uh, I think there are one or two, um, especially I think um, uh, around the Rift Valley, one or two that said they will support it. But so far, to the best of my knowledge, there's none that has endorsed it. So what does the law provide, uh, Daktari, in terms of the period he has to cover? The law gives n uh, three months, 90 days, within which a county must accept or reject. And so there are two alternatives. A county can consider it and endorse it, and then signify to the speakers, or reject it. Alternatively, if that period expires before any particular county has considered it, then by default they've rejected it. So that is the process. Mishima, I wanted to talk to you about budgeting and the issue of money laundering. Because as the president was talking about the dam today and the stealing of the dams, it's always clear to me that tenderers conspire with people international to rob the Kenyan people. Do we have proper laws to find out what naiba malietu koinje? And do we have mechanisms to be able to reach them? You know, grant corruption in this country happens in three ways and at three stages. And Kimarer and Aror is just an example. You saw in that report, as they were saying, that the the Kimwarer, they did not even do a feasibility study. That the last one that was done was 28 years ago. So how would you budget for something for which no feasibility has been done and then go ahead and allocate money and not just allocate money, release that money before even there are any designs and that money then is released to persons who are not even in this country. The three major, the grand corruption happens first in terms of budgeting. And in this country, if you conceive of, if you think of any grand corruption, Kimwarer and Aror included, uh, whether it's Gulana, Kulalo, and all those others, some people sit down somewhere and then put it in the budget policy statement. That budget policy statement, when it comes to parliament, it is with the connivence of some people in parliament, especially the budget committee, because they are supposed to interrogate all those things. It's not interrogated, and then Parliament endorses that budget. So every grand corruption is planned and budgeted. And, and the second stage, once they've planned and budgeted it, then they avoid the procurement. They go through what they call single sourcing, or sometimes something called government to government. This animal called government to government is the single most biggest avenue for grand corruption. Chinese, Japanese say, if you want our money, you yes. must give me SGR. Yes. If the Japanese, you want our road, you must give it to our people. Government. That is, that is, that, then that comes to the third stage. The third stage then is that it is given to a predetermined company. And usually it's financed by a loan. Most of those loans then uh, uh, you know, insist that the company to do it must be from that country. So it is a syndicate where it is budgeted, it is allocated, it is given to a predetermined company, the money is sent to that company, and then when you want to hold them accountable, you find you have nothing. Did you know, for example, Tony? Well, you did a case once for a Japanese company. I know yes, it was yes, established. Yes, and I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> but let me tell you something more interesting. You know, you know the fiasco of the uh, OT Mofo that you know, mishandled our last election. When we now, we were looking at the process, and at the Public Accounts Committee, we even invited their directors. Do you know, for a long time, we could not serve them. Then, then, they just happened. And when they came to us, we discovered, one, that they are not even a registered company in this country. You know, in this, under Kenyan law, you can only be a natural person or a legal person. So if you are not a legal person, then it means you are contracting with a ghost. They are not registered in this country. They, did, they do not have a registered office. They do not even have an address of service. So when you want to hold them accountable, even like the Italia, Italian company for Aurora and Kimorel, then suddenly you find it's in a foreign country, you have no one to go to. Now, the biggest scandal sometimes with these loans is that they give you, they encourage you that you build this dam. It will cost you one billion shillings. We will give you that one billion shillings. But you must give us the company from our country that builds that dam. And most times, you find that they've been given that one billion. In no time, they've done 20% of the work, 
but they claim they are owed <laughs> three billion. <laughs> and that has happened. That In concept, fact, let me tell you. It's called uh, steal and distribute. Yes. Uh, I was, and steal and distribute. <laughs> I was once involved in an international <laughs> arbitration. Yes. Um, and let me tell you, I thank the current MD of Kenjan. That lady was then the company secretary. Kenjan was uh, given money by a country which I will not mention for now to build the Sondu Miriu, uh, you know, uh, project, given about five billion. The insistence was that it has to be given to a company from that country. In no time, that company had done about 40% of the work, had been paid the entire five million, but it was claiming 7.5 billion, more than the entire amount that was given for the entire project. If it were not for the seriousness of some of the officers in Kenjan then, and the seriousness we did, they took the arbitration and we did it here, we did it in London, we did it in Geneva, and we defeated the claim. Many times, that is how corruption happens. They sue, and then those representing government, they concede to that, and that money goes and well, is shared. Whether it is Goldenberg, or agro-leasing, or the dams, or the company you represented in energy, the pattern is the same. You work here, then you have a formula to steal and distribute. To what extent are foreign governments responsible? They come here and give us talk about corruption. They hold meetings with the president everywhere we travel, and they come and they say, we are giving you grant, etc. What do we do? How do Kenyans get My it? view of it is that there are many governments that are concerned with corruption within their country, but totally unconcerned with corruption in foreign lands. In fact, they facilitate it. Many countries, China, for example, has very strict laws in terms of corruption within China, and they, does, they do not tolerate even, even the smallest aspect of corruption. But you'll be surprised to note that they do not have law regarding corruption that is perpetrated in foreign lands. And that is why you will find that there are Chinese companies which cannot even imagine they can be corrupt in their country. But time and again, you, ke you keep hearing of Chin Chinese companies involved in this and that kind of corruption. And there are many other countries like that. I think one of the things that we should speak to very strongly, all the lectures that the ambassadors give us about corruption and all, they should start by doing two things. One, they should start by confirming to us any ambassador from especially some of the Western countries can only speak to us about corruption if they can tell us that their home countries has established that there's no Kenyan who has touched money in that country because there are many. You should start repatriate all the money back to Kenya. Then we can deal with it. And two, they should only speak to us about corruption if they can help us get out of this thing that they give us money but we give that money back to their country through those companies which then involved in corruption. Otherwise, it's all, it's all perpetration of corruption. We are in deep well and we are just digging deeper. What can parliament do? What can our laws do as well to, to make it better? I think parliament has done quite a bit, but it should do more and I've been urging parliament to do more. First of all, the avenues of corruption through government to government or direct procurement should all go. All procurement should be public and it should follow the process. Secondly, I think uh, Parliament must be more involved than it has been before in terms of borrowing. You know, the law requires that when the government borrows, it should make those disclosures. So far, it has not been making those disclosures. We used to make noise as the ODM MPs, but we are always the minority, even when government was borrowing. But I think we should realize that as Parliament, we are supposed to check the executive, not from which party we are. So if we can control borrowing, if we can reduce those avenues of direct procurement, government to government, and thirdly, if we can take charge and impeach one or two ministers who are involved in you know, uh, corruption deals without waiting for them to be charged and convicted, I think we'll have gone a long way. Parliament is only lately starting to work as parliament. I think until about, until the handshake, it was all about the majority and the minority. Post the handshake, many members of parliament are now starting to act as parliamentarians. And I think it is the good, it's the proper time to now also take How charge. can we use the finance bill better? Money laundering rules, more than money. Uh, how can we get asset recovery to work better abroad? I think that uh, the asset recovery agency has tried, 
but it can still do more. Um, it can do more within the country and outside the country. All these guys who are involved in grand corruption, they will never keep that money in the banks. Some, well, sometimes they keep it in the bank. But you can always trace where it is. Some of it, like this Kimarwer Aror Dam scandal. It is clear that the money that was paid found its way back to the country. Some of it may not have come back to the country, but it would have been invested somewhere in somebody's name. I think the day they decide that however high you are, even if it is the president, even if it's the deputy president, even if it's a minister, even if it's a judge or an MP, that you will be named, you will be shamed, and whatever you acquired will be uh, retrieved, then that is the day we will start reducing. I think also that although the president has been speaking passionately about corruption, there's one area where uh, in his speech, in his state of the national address, he said to us in parliament that he cannot act against those who are perceived to be corrupt in his government, he will allow them to be charged. And only once they are charged, then he can act. The law does not require that. You know, the president gets a lot of intelligence. And the president knows who is corrupt and who is not corrupt in his government. Fortunately, ministers, PSS, you do not need any of them to be charged for you to remove them. My suggestion has always been that where the president has that kind of evidence, he should act and remove those people and let criminal law take its course separately from rather than let them stay there and await instructions. This Kim Warer, now that the president has received the report, I think the president should now act. All those who received the money, if they're in government, they should be removed and then charged. I don't think we should wait uh, you know, for the DP 